Hello, my name is Ed Stover. I'm with the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Fort Pierce, Florida. I share the Citrus Cyan Breeding Program with Dr. Greg McCollum. Essentially, our team develops diversity, makes the initial selection, and Dr. McCollum's group then tests it further, and together we make releases. We're fortunate to have had a number of postdocs and um, support scientists that worked with us over the course of the last uh, 12 years. And I need to especially point out Randy Driggers, who's been very much the hands-on lead for the conventional citrus program. And we collaborate very widely with a large group of people to bring the best ideas to bear to find solutions for the, the citrus industry of the US. So can't talk about citrus right now without talking about Wong Long Bing. Uh, it's the, ends up that whoever names it first gets to give it its real name. And Wang Long Bing simply means yellow shoot disease in Chinese. But it's also known as citrus greening. Long known in Asia, first identified in Florida in August of 2005, Texas and California in 2012. Vectored by the Asian citrusilla, this little guy, about the size of a well-sharpened pencil lead. He sits on the leaves and stems within this characteristic 45 degree angle. That Asian citrus psyllid has been in Florida since 1998, but it was not considered an economic pest and not controlled because the pathogen causing Wang Long Bing was not present in Florida. Um, it's since become widespread in Florida, widespread in Texas, spreading in California, fortunately so far not established in the Central Valley, and there are a few finds that have occurred in Arizona. And it's also found in the Gulf states where a handful of citrus trees are grown in people's backyards and a few in small commercial operations. It's associated with the phloem limited bacterium, Liberobacter asiaticus. Within a few years of infection, many citrus trees become weak, have reduced quality fruit, lots of fruit drop, and the trees may die or become economically useless. It's been estimated that approximately 80% of Florida citrus is infected. This is probably an old estimate. And if you were to plant a grove today, within two or three years, you would be virtually assured that 100% of your trees would be infected. With the possible exception of some areas in the panhandle of the state far removed from the major citrus growing area. So growers have learned to manage with enhanced fertilization and irrigation. And doing this, they estimate that the average crop production is about 40% compared to healthy trees although many folks, as I say, are out of business. It's called citrus greening because of the effect on the fruit color development. You can see how green the, these fruit remain. But the most distinctive characteristic is this blotchy model. If you look down the mid rib of the leaf and look on either side, there's a chlorosis that is not bilaterally symmetrical. And if you flip the leaf over and look at it, you'll see that there's no uh, other pathogen or insect damage that could be responsible for that patchy look. In addition to the miscolored fruit in severely affected trees, they can also be misshapen, have a lot of uh, seed abortion and have a flavor that is uh, much less pleasant than an uninfected tree. So in Florida, there was a very rapid response once HLB was found. Unfortunately, it showed very rapid disease development in the first groves where it was detected, from the first find up to 39% of the grove in only 10 months. But almost certainly, these groves had already been infected for many, many months, and the disease was just slow to develop. It got a long latent period of many months to even perhaps several years. And if the disease were to first ingress into a new area, then uh, it, the progression would likely not be this great as long as solid control was occurring and people were removing the infected trees as they came along. So the Florida industry quickly redirected its advertising dollars to research. You don't see the Florida sunshine tree ads anymore. There's been substantial funding by the state of Florida, by the California industry and Florida industry, and from various federal sources. It's been estimated that the total amount spent on research to control HLB, research and extension, would be $1 billion. That includes the salaries of people who are already employed who are focused largely on HLB. At first, growers, almost all growers, did what the plant pathologist had recommended, scouting for infected trees and removing them. But the rapid spread you, you saw in the first bullet up here 
made few willing to remove producing trees. They had the argument, probably a good one, that they were putting themselves out of the business rather than waiting for the disease to do it. Most still spray aggressively for psyllids, even if the groves are 100% HLB affected. And a recent study by Lucas Stalinsky shows that indeed, continued psyllid feeding on, on already infected trees does make disease symptoms worse. They developed a high input management system to maintain the C. last plus trees, that's Candidatus liberobacter asiaticus. Uh, and it seems important to minimize stress to the trees in every way possible. So things like more frequent, smaller irrigations, um, time release fertilization, mini growers still put lots of micronutrient foliar applications. But overall, the cost for producing um, processing oranges has, has now about $2,000 an acre, up from $800 an acre pre-HLB. Production and fruit quality declined markedly, now fairly stable. And it's important to emphasize that cash flow is needed, keeping these trees alive, to implement new solutions in the future as they become available. So to really underscore the effect that HLB has had on Florida citrus, we have here in the red total citrus production, just slightly less orange production because oranges are 90 plus percent of the uh, production from the citrus industry in Florida. In yellow, the grapefruit production. And these are all in thousands of boxes of fruit. Um, so a box of sweet oranges weighs 90 pounds, a box of grapefruit weighs 85 pounds. So based on the May 2020 final statistic, oranges are down 71% and grapefruit down 88% since 0304. The Florida industry is still major fruit industry with uh, an estimated 1.1 billion crop farm gate value, and there's still 430,000 acres in production. If you do the calculations from 1998 to 2004, the mean production was 387 boxes per, the, per acre. In 2019-2020 uh, season, it's down to 177 boxes per acre. So much worse than the 40% reduction, a 54% reduction in production in these trees. My colleague Steve Futch, uh, recently retired from the University of Florida Citrus Extension, had a very interesting project where he went out and photographed the same trees each year at the same time. And this shows a tree very early in HLB development, unlikely at 2011, it was still free of the disease. But you can see that over the four, subsequent four years, the foliage is much less green, it's less full. There are fewer fruit and the fruit are more fully, uh, are less fully colored in uh, 2015 versus 2011. And this probably repre represents pretty successful management of HLB positive trees. In a young grove, particularly a young grapefruit grove, Evidence of infection early on, like this yellow dragon, as it's called, when a shoot is all yellow. Uh, or this, this tree shows even more severe symptoms and is very stunted. When a grove looks like this at uh, two or three years, you're virtually assured that it will never be productive in grapefruit. Due to sweet orange, for some reason, responding more favorably to these advanced production methods, you can grow successfully a newly planted sweet orange tree at this point in Florida with very aggressive management. You see this less now because the bulldozers have been very active, but over 130,000 acres were taken out of production due to HLB infection. One of the other promising notes in addition to the advanced production systems is that the right rootstock helps sustain many HLB sensitive scions. This is from my colleague, Kim Bowman citrus geneticist and, and rootstock breeder with uh, USDA and the same lab that I'm in, the US Horticultural Research Lab. And you can see that Valencia on Super Sour 3 looks much, much better than it does on Swingle or Standard Sour Orange. Um, trees on US 942 also look very similar to this. And the budwood for US 942 is, is at the Citrus um, Clonal Protection Program in California. And so you may be able to get US 942 in Hawaii sometime soon. Desperate times call for desperate measures. A handful of growers have started planting 
a limited amount of acreage, but up to 40 acres at a time in protective screen houses. You can see the, these are uh, pole and cable screen houses with a mesh too small for the psyllids to penetrate. Arnold Schumann, my colleague at the University of Florida in Lake Alfred, has been spearheading this project. And um, he has shown photographs and statistics of really remarkable yields of beautiful fruit, 100% pack out in these greenhouses. But of course, it's, uh, the cost is too great to have a juice industry based on this sort of protection, at least at, the, at this point. Different states have different focuses regarding HLB and ACP. Florida is pretty much committed to living with the disease, looking for therapies, new ways to combat the psyllid, assessing procedures to grow new plantings, and very much looking to a future with resistant trees. California has the psyllid in the south and the coastal areas, but not established in the Central Valley so far. And about 2,000 HLB infected trees have been identified in California, all in residential areas and immediately removed. So the focus is very much on psyllid monitoring and management, extension to alert citizens to the danger of HLB so that they can scalp their own trees and identify the disease early, and diagnostics for early detection. Texas now has widespread psyllids and HLB continues to spread, but so far there are few reports of serious decline. They very much have a strong focus on psyllid biocontrol in residential areas, since uh, trees in people's backyards far outnumber those in commercial orchards. And Arizona, as I say, has had just a few finds of psyllid that were controlled. And I would argue that other states have been very fortunate that HLB was found in Florida first and this intensive research effort mobilized. It's for that reason that the California industry is so focused on ACP control and monitoring um, because they know just how serious the disease is. One of the cleverest things I think that the California industry has done is that they have very much um, focused on a threat to backyard trees in California citrus. They did a study and found that there were more citrus trees in people's backyards than in commercial production. And the same is probably or was true in Florida, but those trees have essentially all gone. Backyard citrus is largely no more in Florida. And so by telling the public that their backyard trees are threatened, it should help mobilize them to look for symptoms, the blotching model and the, the psyllid, um, and hopefully detect any new infections before they become widespread. So my focus, as I said, is citrus cyan improvement. We think we've got the oldest citrus breeding program in the world in existence for 120 years, started by these two guys, Walter Tennyson Swingle and Herbert John Weber. And these are men are legends in, in citrus research. They started their work in a small building in Eustis, Florida. We now have considerably better facilities, um, first uh, inhabited in 2000. And 75% of the US citrus industry has a rootstock and or a scion from this USDA breeding program, with rootstocks being very much um, the majority of the trees in this uh, percentage because Carrizo, which is also Troyer, for some reason it was given two different names, and Swingle are the two most widely used citrus rootstocks in the US and are widely used around the world. So we've released about 29 citrus cyan cultivars. There are a number of more minor ones that I haven't included here. It typically has taken 17 to 63 tree years between cross and release. And Jack Hearn, who is the, uh, the citrus breeder for several decades, and he retired in 1995. And although there were some caretakers from 1995 till 2009, and even some crosses made, there were no releases or even replicated trials established in that period. Initially, the wisdom was that HLB would kill all citrus, that it was a hopeless cause. We identified some HLB tolerance in 2009 and made our first crosses focused on HLB tolerance in 2010. We're looking for solutions in the short, medium, and long run in existing cultivars and most advanced selections, providing a potential for people to grow HLB tolerant varieties right away. A step back, new selections with very conventional citrus cultivar genetics. Brand new hybrids entering testing a little further back in the chain. And then on the longer term, hybrids with more resistant citrus relatives, which I'll describe as I go on, and transgenics, 
which are likely our best choice of actually achieving total immunity to HLB. So we're aggressively intercrossing within conventional citrus and citru citrus relatives, these more distant uh, but resistant relatives, trying to pyramid tolerance or resistance and good market type hybrids of all sorts. So grapefruit-like, um, sweet orange-like, mandarin-like, tangelo-like, ultimately perhaps lemon and lime-like, although those are much less of a focus. We've made more than 26,000 unique hybrids in the last 10 years, focusing on the, the varieties that I just, this phenotypes, the types of citrus that I just described. And uh, those hybrids are placed in the field and evaluated for HLB, fruit and horticultural quality. And we're very much screening things from previous generations as well as new hybrids. The, uh, anything with potential as a cultivar are sent to the Florida Department of Agriculture Division of Plant Industry, or DPI, and we then can place them after they're cleaned up and second test with growers as well as planting them on USDA farms. We make a number of selections that we think do not have the potential for being cultivars but carry such good traits that they're invaluable as parents, and we make those selections as well. So. Uh, Throughout my career, I've uh, worked with fruit industries and, and the, the farmers growing different fruit varieties and I've learned a great deal from them. S the same, of course, is true in citrus. And a number of growers were making the observation that things other than sweet orange seem to be less susceptible to HLB. Greg McCollum and I conducted a survey in commercial groves with multiple cultivars, and these are not easy to find, things that are farms where they're growing things other than sweet orange and grapefruit. But whenever we could find three different varieties growing within close proximity, we, did, we went out and we sampled them, looking at the number of genomes, essentially the uh, number of bacteria present within a 100 nanogram DNA sample, and also the percent of trees that showed symptoms of HLB. And what we found is that some varieties, these in these red boxes, were much higher in the bacterial load and showed much higher incidence of, of uh, symptoms than other varieties. Most notably here, Mineola is always planted with a temple pollinizer. So you can see there's a 30-fold difference in the bacterial load and a third of the level of um, the HLB symptoms in, in, when comparing Mineola and temple. Sweet orange was also statistically significantly worse than temple. And at least at this stage, grapefruit looked quite a bit better than sweet orange. This underscores something that we have learned at all steps in the process of dealing with HLB. What we think we know one year may not be what we're convinced of in subsequent years. So Mineola still shows severe symptoms in terms of blotchy model and develops high populations. But actually the trees are fairly tolerant and they produce a reasonable crop of good fruit. Grapefruit has also shown the opposite effect. Instead of being more, more tolerant to HLB, it is now apparent that it's one of the most sensitive. So th this showed that there were differences between varieties. This was done in a replicated, statistically sound manner. Another example that we found early on is there was a planting of two grapefruit-like hybrids, Triumph grapefruit and its low-seeded variant Jackson, as well as Marsh and Flame. This is what the trees look like in 2010 when I first became aware of them. Uh, one of my predecessors, Jose Chaparro, had planted them. And this is what the trees still look like with the Jackson and Triumph looking quite good and the true grapefruit, most of them just looking like they're ready for the chainsaw. When we took data on them in a number of different categories, overall health, the level of HLB, the canker incidence, the fruit per tree, fruit drop, in 2009 and 2010, what we saw was that in every case except one, the true grapefruit, Flame and Marsh, were much worse than Jackson and Triumph. That exception was in HLB symptoms. Because again, just like with Mineola tangelo, the Jackson and Triumph show substantial symptoms and yet are quite tolerant in terms of tr uh, tree growth um, canopy density and fruit production. This shows you a, a typical flame tree with very misshapen fruit, a very scant um, crop and most of the fruit being small and misshapen versus the full-size triumph fruit with a, a good crop load. 
as I say, Triumph is uh, very seedy, much like Duncan grapefruit, and Jackson has got a, only five or so seeds per fruit, much like Marsh grapefruit. When I show grapefruit growers these trees, they're very excited, and then I cut them open and they say, it's not red, is it? And red is the uh, most desired grapefruit type, but still, a number of growers have put out some Jackson trees and are reporting that they uniformly look quite good, certainly compared to standard grapefruit. So we showed there were considerable differences in HLB tolerance in existing plantings, plantings that were already established at the time HLB entered. The important question for us is what if trees were exposed to sea lass at planting so that they were quickly infected? We went out into uh, nurseries and found some trees that we could get right away. So it's not a perfect experiment. We would have preferred all of them to be on the same rootstock or ideally several rootstocks. We put Hamlin on, we were able to get it on two rootstocks. And at first we thought all of our trees would be on Cleopatra and King Koji. But these trees became available at the last minute. And because there was a lot of interest in them as fresh fruit varieties, we took them on and included them in this replicated trial. What we saw after six years of replicated data collection was that the sugar belt on sour, tango on kuharski, and temple on cleopatra had much higher fruit yields than the other varieties, and that the health of them also was much higher in terms of their uh, visual appearance, basically density of canopy and the uh, evidence of HLB symptomology. The sugar bell on sour and tango and kuharski also grew substantially better with a change in trunk diameter being much, much greater than the sweet oranges and, and grapefruit. And what you'll see here, and we see this again and again now, is that uh, the true grapefruit is the worst performer in this trial. Now, the proper way to compare this is consider them scion rootstock combinations, but none of these rootstocks are associated with greater tolerance. So we think this is primarily a scion effect and that's what we've seen again and again. So pictures, in case the statistics don't impress you much, here's a sugar bell on sour orange next to a hamlin on Kinkoji. You see the thinner canopy, uh, it's harder to see the fruit since they're greenish, but there are a lot more fruit on this tree than on this one. And of course, much bigger size. And Tango on Kuharski, you can see the nice dense canopy, green color, large size. These are all taken from the same distance away. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's evident that potentially economically useful tolerance is not uncommon in conventional Mandarin hybrids. Several Clementine by Orlando and Sugar Bell, which is a Clementine by Mineola, are the best documented. Both Mineola and Orlando are Tangelos, in fact, there are some reports that they are two seeds from the same fruit and others where they're from uh, two seeds from the same tree in the year that they were first harvested and germinated. So we have a replicated population of Fairchild by Fortune, which both of which are Clementine by Orlando, to look for segregation for, for tolerance to HLB, as well as other mandarins. And they're in a replicated trial at the USDA PICOS farm. This was a collaboration between Mike Roos of UC Riverside and Fred Gemitter of the University of Florida. And we're trying to identify genes for tolerance. So as I said, we're most importantly a breeding program making about 3,000 new hybrids each year. Uh, we've got a wide range of strategies to combine resistance and tolerance for diverse market phenotypes. And we feel like we're making better crosses each year as we learn more about this disease and the way citrus trees respond. So it's important to know how our new selections hold up to HLB. We put in a replicated trial of 50 different USDA selections and standards after a very aggressive treatment. First, no choice CLAS plus or hot ACP for a week. And that's where every tree was in its own cage with 20 in infected psyllids. And then four months in a, a hot ACP house just swarming with psyllids and, and including lots of infected trees. And then we put them out in the field in the Picos farm. This photograph is from five and a half years and you can see some trees are very healthy looking and have grown well while others are quite sickly and stunted. If we look at the data um, here at 3.5 years, what we see again underscores how we learn new th things about HLB as time passes. US seedless surprise 
is one of the top performers. Everything in yellow on the next two slides are in the top performing statistical group. So seedless surprise looked really good at this point. Excellent canopy volume, uh, good tree health, good canopy density. Flame was already at the very bottom and it, it stayed at the bottom. Sunburst, which had been one of our most important um, Mandarin types pre-HLB has in this trial and in every trial we've put it in has shown remarkably poor tolerance to HLB. But then after five and a half years in the ground, the story changes. Now US seedless surprise has dropped near the bottom in most categories. And much of that is reflected in the very poor canopy volume relative growth rate, the percent increase in canopy volume from the previous year to this year. We see two major sources of tolerance, um, Clementine by Orlando, and uh, so Fortune is Clementine by Orlando, crossed with Encore, a somewhat different Mandarin variety, and but a very conventional Mandarin background. And the second category that's been showing uh, good evidence of HLB tolerance are those that have Pensiris trifoliata, here listed as PT in their background. And I do need to point out that Valencia is in the best category for canopy density and tree health, but is falling behind in some other categories, canopy volume and relative growth rate. And Sun Dragon, which I'll talk more about later, is in the top group in all categories. So what we see if we compare within a type of fruit, so here, sweet orange type, we've got a Ponsiris trifoliata containing uh, sweet, sweet orange type, you can see that it continues to grow well over this two year per period, as does Sun Dragon. Sun Dragon showing remarkably flat uh, or consistent growth, whereas Valencia continues to grow but at a much lower rate, so much lower relative growth rate. Grapefruit in contrast, so US Sela Surprise looked great at first and then plateaued off. Jackson continues to grow at a fairly st uh, steady rate. And flame grows at a very low uh, speed. And the same is true if we look at different Mandarin types. So th this, we think, tells us that relative growth rate may be the best early evidence of tolerance. We conducted a large study, a collaboration with the UC Riverside, the uh, Gene Bank in Riverside, which is a USDA facility, and our, our team at USHRL. We got a bunch of seeds of 85 different citrus relative genotypes uh, and citrus genotypes showing, uh, and, and after a six year study, we showed that Pensiris was our trifoliate orange is among the most resistant to HLB and also showed the lowest level of psyllid colonization, but not zero. So it truly is resistant to HLB as well as being uh, somewhat resistant to psyllid colonization. We've shown this by uh, graft inoculating and showing that HLB develops poorly still. So Pensiris is deciduous, quite cold hardy. I th thought this was a cool photograph showing the snowpack in uh, the leaf free branches. It's very seedy and very foul tasting and that foul taste continues for a couple of generations in hybrids. If someone cruelly convinces you to taste one of these fruit, what you're going to find is it tastes so horrible, so acrid, that you'll be spitting for the next hour to try to get the flavor out of your mouth. So based on this finding that Pensiris showed substantial evidence of tolerance and desiring to figure out what genes were associated, we put 100 plus different citranges, which are sweet orange crossed with Pensiris, replicated in, in, in a field, all grafted onto Volcomer lemon rootstock. And we also put in uh, a number of our Pensiris containing hybrids in a replicated fashion to see how they did. The Gemitter team has led a mapping effort for tolerance and identified four QTLs, quantitative trait loci, which are just chunks of DNA that seem to have genes associated with tolerance. So this U.S. sun dragon I've been teasing you with, we're among the largest, healthiest trees in the entire planting. Here it is here in comparison to the other trees. This is at two years and it continues to till today. And these are data collected on a number of selections with Pensiris pedigree and Volk seedlings. And the Volk seedlings continue to look good. And I'm not going into that story, but anything with citron in its background seems to show some tolerance to HLB. And for that reason, a number of Florida growers are now planting lemons, which they've not done in the past. 
So among the top performers in trunk diameter, canopy volume, canopy density, low mortality, and um, actually strangely with somewhat higher blotchy model than, than uh, no, I'm sorry, this is still the lowest level of blotchy model, is our US sun dragon. This shows a Hamlin tree and a sun dragon tree in the same row. These are pictures taken from the same distance. And you can see that the sun dragon trees look really gorgeous in comparison to sweet oranges and are loaded with fruit. So based on this and other observations, we've had it out in a lot of different places and it looks good everywhere. It's our first release scion for fresh fruit containing Pensiris. It's one eighth Pensiris. There have been a few other Pensiris containing hybrids released, but they were strictly as breeding parents. I describe it as being like a navel orange in an alligator hide. Uh, we released it with a focus on use in backyards or dooryards, uh, niche citrus markets and for use in breeding. But to our surprise, it scored highly in sweet orange juice trials at the U.S. Horticultural Research Lab and a major processor. It should be noted that before the fruit is tr truly ripe to a small percentage of people, it seems to have a little bit of a soapy flavor that some people find off-putting. But fortunately, as the trees mature and the fruit reach tr true maturity, um, that off taste goes away. It's been used in many crosses and some of the hybrids are starting to fruit as I'll show you. Here's a row of trees at the U.S. Horticultural Research Lab farm in Fort Pierce. You can see the trees look quite good despite this being sort of HLB hell where HLB is absolutely everywhere and no effort is made to control the psyllids, helping to make it a great experimental site for assessing response to HLB, but not being a great place for most trees to grow. As I say, we've used it as a parent, mainly as a pollen parent, because it doesn't have very many seeds. And you can see we've made some selections of sun dragon. And so far, these look pretty good in terms of HLB tolerance. And we're continuing to find some new selections from its brothers and sisters, the full sieves. And this one is interesting because of its high sugar, 16 bricks, and substantial acidity, and yet, and yet no drying in June 1st of the year following bloom. So we're, this, this underscores the potential we're unlocking with our breeding program. Uh, and I'm not going to go into that here, but we're also, it also emphasizes the value of discussing new hybrids for use in orange juice by considering changing the orange juice standards in the Federal Register. So I talked about Pensiris from being looking good in this trial of 85 citrus genotypes. Aromocitrus and microcitrus, two genera from Australia, also shown, showed strong lass resistance and psyllid resistance. And we have a new collaboration with the Queensland Australia citrus breeder, Malcolm Smith, uh, who has the most advanced microcitrus material. And so our goal is to then introgress microcitrus-based um, resistance, microcitrus being microcitrus australasica, which is featured in this, being the finger line, into market types that will, will be uh, slow to develop, to develop, unfortunately. And this shows you the diversity of material. Each set of different colored stakes represents a different cross ranging from 100% microcitrus, you see a clear finger line here, to things that are as little as 12.5% citrus, 12.5% uh, microcitrus. So if we're gonna introgress aromacitrus and microcitrus into conventional market phenotypes, it's gonna take a lot of crosses so that we can back cross out the undesirable characteristics while retaining the good characteristics. So there's, there's a gene called flowering locust tea that has been used in several plant varieties to cause much earlier flowering. And we think we've now found something that works in citrus breeding. We've got a, an FT variant that results in flowering of many of the resulting transgenics uh, within six months or so of the seed germinating. We've shown that the flowers that are produced have pollen that germinates and we've made crosses of this FTM cherry uh, translational fusion into priority hybrids. And we hope to combine it with CRISPR to document the ability to use that gene editing or genome editing that you've all heard about uh, in a way that results in genome edited citrus with no transgene in subsequent generations. I should note this work is being done in collaboration with Tim McNellis, Penn State and Gloria Moore. 
at the University of Florida. This shows the first group of uh, seedlings from the, the first and only fruit we got in 2019. Uh, and one of those has flowered. We, because of the pandemic, we still haven't been able to test to verify whether or not the others simply don't have the transgene. So it works, and we think it's gonna open up the vast diversity of the citrus gene pool. We're thinking that this will permit 100 years of conventional citrus breeding in 15 to 18 years with the final product not being a transgenic. The idea is that we would take um, an early flowering type with a marker for HLB tolerance or other desirable trait, and HLB tolerance is the first thing we're gonna be looking at. So hopefully we can find the HLB resistance or tolerance genes from microcitrus, recognize the DNA sequence that's responsible, test resulting seedlings from use of this early flowering background uh, for presence of that marker, and then make subsequent back crosses or pseudo back crosses to similar varieties in mandarin, sweet orange, grapefruit, perhaps lemon, perhaps tangelo. And uh, over the course of three to four generations, generate something that is uh, largely the market phenotype background with the early flowering gene and the DNA marker for HLB tolerance. And then in the final generation, it's gonna take a lot longer, pushing us up to 15 to 18 years for the total process because we will not have the early flowering gene. And instead we will be selecting among the large number of progenies that are standard in their flowering and not transgenic. So now I'm gonna talk about some things we've released. We released a variety and really good tasting uh, mandarin that is seedy, uh, but it does well in a, the subtropical environment of Florida, and therefore it might do well in Australia and uh, Hawaii. And so we have US fur and US fur ST, a, a scab tolerant irradiated selection that have been released. They are seedy, um, but uh, superb tasting, moderately vigorous, thornless, and showing some HLB tolerance. Uh, I need to show you the US Sun Dragon again as being one of our release varieties released in 2018. Others released in 2018, a low seeded from a radiation US Ortonique. This is standard Ortonique with uh, uh, a number of seeds in the fruit. And then this is the low seeded variety with seven or fewer seeds per fruit in mixed planting. So surrounded by abundant pollen that can be used to uh, hybridize with the flowers and help sustain fruit set. So Ortonique is among the latest of mandarin varieties and it has a very rich flavor, but its lateness is its uh, primary virtue to help extend the market season. And it does have moderate HLB sensitivity. It's not one of the most uh, tolerant of varieties. U.S. Seedless Surprise, I mentioned earlier, it's a very grapefruit-like, but very mild, no evidence of the bitter tonic quality and very low acidity. It's, uh, it doesn't even have any bitterness in the flesh uh, the, or the, the segment walls. It ripens very early, September to October in Florida, October to mid-November in California, very grapefruit-like, few seeds, beautiful fruit, great taste. Consumer preference test shows U.S. seedless surprise were much preferred over grapefruit. Um, the downside is it's highly HLB sensitive. It's as bad or worse than conventional grapefruit. <coughs> but if you don't have HLB, it might be something you'd be interested in growing. <coughs> Excuse me. Another grapefruit type that is uh, very low in bitterness and acidity, U.S. Honeycoat, which is a true grapefruit. It's an irradiated foster. This shows you honeycoat with its thick uh, rind compared to standard grapefruit here, ruby. Similar color to ruby. One of the best tasting grapefruit you'll ever experience. It ripens from October to mid-January in North Central Florida at our Leesburg farm. And in California, I think it may be uh, possible to grow this grapefruit that matures before the next season's flowering. As it is now, Grapefruit have to be on the tree for more than 12 months in California. Vigorous with similar crop load and growth habit as other conventional grapefruit varieties. Some anecdotal evidence that it may be somewhat more cold tolerant, but its HLB sensitivity is high like other grapefruit. Again, you might be interested in growing it in Hawaii since you've managed to keep HLB at bay at 
to this point. U.S. Superna, one of our most recent releases, uh, Jack Hearn, uh, the, the plant reader at the U.S. Horticultural Research Lab for many years, says it's the best tasting citrus from his career. It's nearly seedless for, because it apparently it's got some uh, meiotic abnormalities, some sort of chromosomal translo uh, translocation or inversion that results in a very low fertility of both the pollen and the seeds. It, it had been trialed in California as 88-2, so it's, it's a definitely available from CCPP in California. You can get budwood in Hawaii, and it potentially has useful tolerance to HLB. Both of its parents are Clementine by Orlando, that happy combination of parentage that um, seems to confer a high probability of HLB tolerance. It crops very poorly in Florida, or at least that was the report, with light to medium crops of uh, just superb and beautiful fruit in California. In fact, my friend David Karp wrote a nice article how this brilliant variety of Mandarin went supernova, saying it may become your favorite fruit. So we have a replicated planting at our Leesburg farm with the primary intention being cold hardiness because it's a very cold spot by the standards of Florida citrus. To my surprise, uh, U.S. Superna, uh, along with Dancy Tangerine, were among the best performing varieties. Much, 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 much better than uh, other varieties and especially much greater in its uh, yield and growth and health than the grapefruit in the trial. So it could be that the difference is that we are planting on different rootstocks than the, that one early trial that discouraged release and production in Florida. I would be remiss in talking about new varieties, not to mention Sugar Bell, not a USDA release, but from the University of Florida by my colleague, Fred Gemitter. It's a Clementine by Mineola. So very similar to the background of the Clementine by Orlando, as I described. The tree and fruit are remarkably similar to Mineola, but it's heavier bearing uh, and it's somewhat earlier than Mineola, which in Florida means it's got a Thanksgiving market with little evidence of alternaria susceptibility. And it probably is the most HLB tolerant variety that has already been released. These, these are beasts. They continue to grow despite very high levels of um, HLB symptoms. We have a number of mandarins that are a little bit further back in the queue, not released. One is, of our very best is 22-79, an irradiated fortune by Encore. Uh, just a beautiful, virtually seedless, easy peeling, remarkably rich and tasty variety. And we're assembling a package to patent this at the request of the industry. USDA 5-51-2, once again, at Clementine by Orlando, looks really just dynamite in the presence of HLB. And we've got some irradiated low seeded selections that we're also testing. This shows just how good it is in uh, its response to HLB. This is a block of 5-51-2 surrounded by US Early Pride. US Early Pride is a temple by Clementine by Orlando. And so this shows how the genetics really are reassorting in a way that means we gotta understand them so that we can take full advantage of HLB tolerance. Um, and this, this sort of data compels the need for what is called genomic selection, for, for in our case, for HLB tolerance, where we identify the genes associated with HLB tolerance through looking at a lot of different varieties and learn what gene fragments are associated with that tolerance so that we can select them and focus on them, not only in terms of selections, but also in choosing parents for the next round of hybrids. And that work is now underway. We've got a lot of very sweet orange-like hybrids. That's been our one of our holy grails uh, before HLB existed. And this 175.55 tastes for all the world like an excellent sweet orange. And in Florida is peelable by hand to the same degree that a California navel is. And navels in Florida don't peel easily. So this should be much, much better peeling uh, than standard um, navels even. Ripens the same time as Hamlin, very orange like appearance, taste, and aroma volatiles, but better color. Uh, this might be something you, you would be interested in. It's not super strong against HLB, but it's better than Hamlin. We've been using a, a golf ball sized, totally seedless mandarin called Kishu, which you, you're probably familiar with. 
It confers genetic seedlessness when it's used as a palm parent in a mandarin background to 50% of its progeny. And these are some of the selections that we've made. You can see that they're dead seedless. These are easy peeling. They are very uh, tasty, not as tasty as the other varieties that I've been talking about, but uh, a, a fun and easy variety for children and, and others. We've got more advanced material, including some things made with Kishu hybrids as the pollen parent that are looking really good. Um, this is one we're pretty excited about. Uh, a very late Kishu hybrid with zippy acidity in April and no vesicle drying. So a uh, great pollen parent and possible niche fruit. I say niche fruit because the peel is a little loose to go down a packing line in Florida, but would be great for a backyard tree or a niche market. And this is our first sweet orange-like variety with seedlessness from Kishu. So just once again to reiterate, we've made more than 26,000 unique hybrids in the last 10 years from more than 600 unique parental combinations. We're going all out to try to find HLB tolerance and, and generate a wide array of market phenotypes um, that have that HLB tolerance from our breeding program. We've also pursued a number of uh, strategies to develop transgenics. The best documented so far are uh, athionin transgenic and transgenics producing an antibody to CLAS membrane or secreted proteins. I'll show you just a bit more about that. Um, so our program really took off when we started collaborating with Gautam Gupta and he's been designing antimicrobial peptides that have looked very promising in uh, laboratory assays and early greenhouse assays. And we're excited to have them out in the field now for the first time with the planting made last week. His designs are based on a computer model analysis of peptide interaction with gram negative membranes. This shows the kind of uh, model of a gram negative membrane and then the peptide, he, he models the number of times it inserts and the depth to which it inserts and then modifies them slightly with just slightly different amino acid uh, variants. And these are based on items from the citrus proteome. So they're very, very similar to citrus gene products. The other most successful to date has been a uh, project with John Hartung at uh, USDA in Beltsville, Maryland, although he's recently retired. And uh, he uses, he, he identified some small chain variable fragment antibodies to the Candidavis liberobacter proteins TOL-C, which is membrane bound, and NVA, which is secreted, both of which are, are uh, we have reason to believe based on other pathosystems, are critical to pathogenesis. So we're moving ahead with those. I won't go into any detail. We're also looking at some other methods. You probably have heard of RNA interference. We're trying to figure out how to use that to generate HLB tolerant citrus varieties. We're also using genome editing, which we hear a lot about in human medicine. It's also being used in agriculture. To, it mainly at this point can be used to knock out genes. And the desire is to knock something out by transient expression of this Cas9 and guide RNA so that the resulting genome edited plant is actually free of transgenes. And to to figure out what genes to knock down in either RNAi or uh, genome editing, we've got to figure out what genes are important in terms of allowing the development of HLB in susceptible plants. So we've got a range, uh, Pansiris, which is HLB resistant, Carrizo, HLB tolerant, and Hamlin, HLB sensitive. And Carrizo is a cross between Pansiris and Sweet Orange. We've got uh, all of them generated as transgenics with a tagged ribosomal protein. And we're expressing them using flown specific promoters so we can figure out what genes are turned on in infected versus uninfected plants of sensitive versus tolerant and resistant plants. And then we will pursue those gene targets with our uh, RNAi and genome editing. This is another approach we've taken where we've looked at effector genes and figured out which ones are turned on, are, are turned on within CLAS very early 
in the infection process. The effectors are essentially genes produced by the pathogen to interfere with host resistance so that the disease can develop. And we've taken the six earliest highest level effectors and put a flag tag on them and they're being expressed so that we can pull them down and see what citrus gene product is uh, attached to them. So a lot of work is being done. Uh, we have a tiny fraction of that billion dollars, but we're trying to make our best use out of it. And we've been fortunate to get funding. First of all, USDA ARS, ARS base funding, which pays for the lab and my salary and one technician. Uh, Florida Citrus Research and Development Foundation has been consistent in giving us uh, a very nice amount, a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year. New Varieties Development and Management Corporation gives us about a hundred thousand a year um, each year for our conventional breeding program. We've been successful in getting several NIFA grants in collaboration with other researchers, which has been a, a very pleasant uh, uh, source of fun funding for us um, and we've made a lot of progress with it. The Florida Citrus Research Foundation was set up by a group of Florida citrus growers to provide a farm for USDA citrus breeding, which is our Whitmore farm in Leesburg, Florida. We've gotten a small amount of money from the California Citrus Research Board and from USDA APHIS and as I say, the DPI Budwood office has just been amazing in terms of getting our material cleaning it up and making it possible for us to take it back out to farmers fields. There have been a bunch of folks who've contributed to the work I've described in the greenhouse lab and field and here are some of their happy smiling faces. So um, this you're likely seeing online so I cannot be asked questions right away but Ken Love knows my email address and I'd be happy to hear from you and try to answer any questions you have. Um, once again, it's a pleasure to visit with the Hawaii Tropical Fruit Growers, and I, and I wish you all well, and keep HLB out of Hawaii.